BioBalance HealthCast, episode 175, The Secret Female Hormone UK Book Tour. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Kathy and I are really, really excited because our book, The Secret Female Hormone, that we've been working on for the last couple of years has been published, and we are uh, on our way to London. And we're going the, the book is going to be published in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in South Africa, in Canada, in Delhi. India, uh, and the United States. Mm-hmm. And the press in London have become aware of our book and have uh, reached across the pond to interview us. And we are now going to London uh, later this week when this podcast is, is released. We'll be in London to give a talk at the Nutri Center. Uh, in London, and we will do a couple of bookstore signings there and in Cambridge and in Bath. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's quite an exciting thing for us. And, and we've been, uh, one of the interviews that we did was for the Style Magazine of the Sunday Times of London. And our Looks article like uh, was so happy. produced, <laughs> and we we're and wanting our, to talk about it today. Our article looked like this, which is kind of dramatic. Mm-hmm. So, don't know what that picture means, but looks dramatic. Yep, it looks like her. Hormone um, deficit is strangling her. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things we're learning about is that the national health system in England is significantly different in its operation from the way medicine is practiced in the United States. And we've gotten feedback. Fortunately, Kathy has actually several clients who have either lived in England or who still live in England but come to the United States to see her to get the treatments that she mm-hmm. provides because they can't get those treatments through the NHS or the National Health Service. So we are interested in learning more about that. And in preparation for our visit, we've looked into some of the circumstances that, that work in England. And we found that there are private doctors who are not part of the NHS system that do prescribe hormone replacement, and in particular testosterone, for women. And there are places where this treatment is known and available. But what we've been told is that a number of people in England are hoping that the marketing of our book will pick up momentum to make more doctors aware and maybe even to get the National Health Service to start to consider uh, allowing these treatments and prescriptions as part of the regular health coverage that people have. The National Health Service used to pay for this. Uh They used to pay for it because I have several uh, patients that have that used to live in in mm-hmm. London and have moved here, and they said as they were leaving, and it may have been ten years ago. Time flies when you're having fun, but yes. I mean, but they stopped paying for testosterone and estrogen pellets, and they I think that's because they swing toward what the U.S. is doing, maybe, mm-hmm. and as the U.S. becomes less friendly for that kind of thing, then they kind they decide. Well, we're not going to do it if they're not going to do it, no matter what the research says. Right. So, and they also have the problem of paying for everything. Mm. So, if they can throw something out and they don't have to pay for it, then that's one thing they can throw out of the. Um, it's kind of a socialized system that that um, pays for everybody's health care. So that's what they could throw out because U.S. isn't doing it. So they stopped doing that, but they used to, and it used to be paid for. Mm-hmm. And so. I think that most of the people who have had that kind of treatment before and live in London, live in in Britain, are wondering maybe this book will bring it back to us uh-huh. and make and make those doctors who used to do it do it again. Well, now Sharon Walker was the author of this piece in the Sunday Times, and she spent more than an hour with us mm-hmm. on the phone and had read the book and done a lot of ancillary oh, research. Oh, yeah, she did her research. Uh, so what, what did you learn from the questions that she was asking about, about uh, our book and the, the message for our book in London? Well, she was, she was asking about, she, we have age groups in here, but who would, who would need this? How old you would have to be? What were the circumstances that would bring patients to realize that they had this issue? Mm-hmm. And uh, because sometimes younger women without ovaries or younger women with premature ovarian failure need testosterone right and then she was she was asking if we knew any doctors there Mm -hmm. which we didn't have access to any doctors but she did she did her research and she found several doctors there 
that do provide testosterone for patients, and she interviewed them, which was really nice, mm -hmm. and added that to her uh, expose. And she was interested in the different types of testosterone and what what was the safest, what was the most convenient, and uh, about how we do our testosterone replacement, which is uh, my preference and my really the only thing I do is now, testosterone pellets. When you say different types of testosterone, you're really talking about different delivery methodologies, Yeah, it's, right? it's, it's all it's bioidentical, but it's either transdermal, meaning a cream or a gel, or it is going to be a vaginal tablet or an under-the-tongue tablet, mm -hmm. a shot, or a... Um, a pellet under the skin. So those are the options, and she she was curious about all of that, where and about the pharmacies we get them from, mm -hmm. and how we access that. Uh, she talked a lot about the FDA, and because they don't have they have a similar uh, organization that's governmental, but they don't have the FDA. Right, but do they have compounding pharmacies in England yeah. for yeah, the they physicians do. to use? Mm -hmm. I mean, compounding pharmacies are what pharmacies all were a long time ago. Uh -huh. Pharmacies used to make up whatever drug you needed. They so didn't just take a pill off the shelf. As a physician, would you then write a prescription for a dash of this and a pinch of that and some of this, and then the pharmacist would pull all that together? Yes, but they're not dashes and pinches. But they're, <laughs> they're milligrams, micrograms, but yes. And, and physicians are trained to know that and do that? We used to be. Used to be. I had to be retrained to know that. Yeah, because you still do that mm -hmm. for some things. Yeah, I do. I do. Sometimes, well, we have a um, compounded Viagra. It's not really Viagra, but it's a compounded uh, substance that has B12 Yohimbi, which is a an herbal, um, uh, actually, co component. It's it's an herb. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you do it in certain amounts, but the B12, that, and the um, generic... Viagra, and we write that, and it seems to work better than Viagra, okay. and faster, and it and it, it lasts longer. So I have to write that up like a recipe, uh -huh. and so that's that's how the pharmacist gets it. <coughs> that's how the pharmacist makes it, and then sends it to my patient. Mm -hmm. But now, the, when it's made by a compounding pharmacy, it's still under the umbrella of the FDA in terms of safety and procedures and replication mm -hmm. and sanitation and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Is it under the FDA in terms of what you can write and, and how they can put it together? There, I mean, there are some things I can't write. I mean, I can't in the state of Missouri, and, and the states differ in what you can write, but in the state of Missouri, I can't write THC, which is marijuana. I mean, right. there are controlled controlled substances that right. no matter who makes them, you can't write them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they are considered really controlled substances and in some states illegal. So that I can't write. So medical marijuana, you couldn't write a prescription no. for that and have the pharmacist make something. But what about testosterone then? Is that a controlled substance? Yes. In fact, it's interesting. Usually controlled substances are substances that are addictive mm -hmm. or, or dangerous. And, and that makes sense. Right. But yeah. testosterone is our own hormone. Right. And it's neither addictive or dangerous. As long as the doctor's writing it, we're not going to write it for a kid. Right. I mean, that's, that's the responsibility of a physician is to write, you know, to give the proper drug to the proper patient. But for some reason, they've made this a very controlled substance. We have to count the pellets. We have to we have to c keep track of them like we would if it was morphine. Wow. And it's it's kind of crazy. So so every day so your practice your nurses like count out however many appointments they have in the day and and what dosages they know they're going to use. And the counts have to match. Wow. And if you drop one, we have to put that in the you know we have to lost and disposed lost of. and disposed of column, and we have to keep track of all of that. And everybody who does for testosterone pills. Yeah, pellets. Pellets. Yeah. Right. And if you and they, they've even made the restrictions greater in the last six months, which mm -hmm. is actually even crazier. I mean, this is not something that you get addicted to. If you right. if you need it, you need it. If you don't need it, it doesn't do much it's for you. It's not like morphine or anything. No. It's nothing like that. And it's, and is that comparable to what they deal with in England as far as you're now coming to understand? Um, I feel I, I don't think that they have such restrictions. I just think the restriction is that they don't have a lot of doctors who do this. Okay. I think it, it fell. It's not in, a governmental regulation. It's something that's fallen off the radar. Right. Well, it's only governmental in that they don't pay for it under the health service. Right. They have a two tiered system. They have a they have governmental medicine which provides you with everything 
that you must, they think you must have. Uh -huh. And then they have another tiered system that you can pay for getting different kinds of treatments. And so that is, that's all cash. So in that system, they're able to do it. So as I was participating in this interview and the other one that we've done that's going to come out in a magazine in the United Kingdom in the next week or so, uh, one of the things that I heard them say over and over again, and they came at it in different directions, is why you? Who, who are you that you've written this book? Who are you that you know about I've this I've always stuff? asked myself that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, it, but that's, a, that's a different take on the why me, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how is it that you are the person in the spotlight now saying, I have this information and I do this treatment for these thousands of people that come to my office or, or have come, and they get better. Uh, how did you stumble across this? The, the, big, the biggest issue was I had this. I mean, I had my ovaries removed and my life was, was taken away from me, basically, because I didn't have testosterone. I, I had I had access to estrogen. I had it replaced in every form possible and it did not make me better. Didn't solve the problem. And well for those it, for those people that aren't that regular out. watchers yes. of our health cast, walk through that story a little bit if you okay. would. So um, my ovaries were removed at forty seven, but before I was forty seven I started feeling I, having the symptoms of testosterone deficiency, uh -huh. but they weren't, which is not labeled anywhere. It's I mean, not. That's not yeah. a diagnosis. That's that a diagnosis can... that we've made that we've coined because there is no name for this. Right. But it is <laughs> testosterone deficiency. So, yeah. so like we've, the disease we've that cannot be it. mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can't. You can't yeah. name. You can't have a disease unless there's a name for it and a number for it. Right. So we've named it and numbered it. But at the time, I was not feeling well, I was gaining weight, I was tired, and I was, I'm an OBGYN, and I always had lots of energy, and I didn't really look the same, I was looking swollen, I was, uh, uh, I mean, I was miserable, I was depressed, and I at first started seeing a few doctors, and I wasn't desperate yet, and they told me that this was all normal, and that I should just, You're just not old. worry about it. It's just what just happens to women as they get older. Right. And I was in my early 40s, and I thought, Everybody in my family lives to 90. I don't want to live like this. Yeah. This is this is not how I had envisioned the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I continued to practice, and I but I was really fatigued. I couldn't do anything else. I kind of cut everything else out of my life. Yeah. So then I had endometriosis, so I had to have a hysterectomy. And I put it off until I couldn't walk. That's how bad the pain was. Yeah. So I envisioned, oh, the pain's causing this. Well, what happened was... When my ovaries were taken out, and I had I had a kind of a different surgery. I had a, a, an emergency during the surgery, and I ended up in the unit, and I ended up on a respirator. Had a near-death experience, which is not common. In fact, I've never had a patient have that. It was a very outlandish kind of thing to happen, and it was nobody's fault. My body just mis right. miscued. And I ended up in the ICU wondering when I woke up what was wrong and then having a near death experience which I was sent back from and all and I was told you need to go back because there's something for you to do there's other things for you to do and you have to go back I didn't really want to go back it was awesome there <laughs> but you know so I so I came back and I kept waiting for this when's it going to get better thing because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do something and I felt Terrible. And and when you say you were going to physicians, you weren't just going to gynecologists and general practitioners. I was going, going to endocrinologists, to endocrinologists, and endocrinologists, psychiatrists. Every I mean, every kind of physician yeah. I could Why think of. Why is this happening to me? And because when my ovaries were out, then it was a drastic change. Everything that I'd started to feel got worse, mm -hmm. and I, and I knew it was hormonal of some kind. And endocrinologists just patted me on the head and said, "Oh, honey, and not men, okay, not all men." Honey, it's it's okay. You're just getting old. Just you know, and of course they're younger than I am, and I'm like, Pfft. you know, I said this is something really wrong with me. I know there's something really wrong with me. I need you to find out what it is, and and they just said, see ya, bye. That was it. That was the end of the consultation. It's like the old doctor joke. Have you ever had this before? Yeah. Well, you got it again. That'll be a hundred dollars. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, it was like they didn't want to really try to figure out what was wrong with me. They ran the test. They said there's nothing wrong. Well, that meant the tests were okay, but they hadn't thought of what it could be. Right. And I ended up going to Mayo Clinic. I, I mean, it ended up being yeah. a long, long process of figuring out what was wrong. They didn't figure it out either. But when but I the was... the fickle finger of fate The fickle finger you. of fate was that I finally gave up. I was going to quit practicing. I, I, I couldn't get out of bed. And um, 
I I just was waiting to deliver twins, and I was like, I mean, I was slid down in my chair right. waiting in labor right. delivery, and one of the nurses says, what's wrong with you? And I yeah. told her, and she goes, you know, my brother's a gynecologist, and he's coming into town tomorrow, and to see my mom, but he's been trying to get these idiots around here to <laughs> to learn how to replace testosterone. And I think that's what's wrong with you. You've got all the symptoms of it. Mm-hmm. Would you like to meet him? I'm like, yes. And tell him to bring whatever it is right. he's got it he brings because I need help right now. Because I'm, I'm making a decision to, to continue yeah. my life or stop it. Yeah. And she said, Okay, okay, that'd be great. So I met him, Gino Tatera, I met him and he um he looked at me and he listened to me and he talked to me and showed me all of the research, which there was tons of research. Yeah. And no doctors that I saw here knew right. anything, about, anything it. about it. And research in the endocrine journals, the OBGYN journals, the uh, reproductive health journals, tons of research that I'd never even seen. And so he treated me and I slept. I hadn't been sleeping at all. I slept that first night. I mean, it was the weirdest thing. I thought, this is... This isn't real. Yeah. Well, I had been having migraines like every other day, having to go home from work. And and my migraine, I haven't had a migraine now in, in 12 years. Wow. So that was the last migraine I had. I slept. I started getting my life back. I got my sense of humor back. Everything mm-hmm. came back over the next three to four months. And so I, I asked him to train me. Mm-hmm. And so then he trained me. And I started just basically doing this for a small portion of my patients who I couldn't figure out who had the same symptoms as I did. Mm -hmm. And what he trained me to do, I did for them and they got better. So it was, it was really miraculous. And then I found out what I was supposed to be doing. So that's why me. Such a serendipitous journey. I mean, accidents happen and yet they seem to happen. I don't think, I don't really believe accidents You don't call them accidents. Exactly. I mean, it's, it, but that was what I was supposed to do. And then I, I, my patients came in and said, you have to, you have to write this in a book. Mm -hmm. We, we have to tell people about it, but we can't explain it exactly how you explain it to us. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing podcasts Mm-hmm. And we started writing a book. And then I met you to help me write the book. There was a long period of time where I was trying to write with several other people, but it didn't really click. And I didn't stick with it. It's, mm-hmm. it's hard to write a book. I mean, it's mis- it's misery to write a book if you're not a natural-born writer. Yeah. You know, So I, I had to learn what I was supposed to be doing. And we we learned together and stayed focused. And Well, that's a key. One, three one years of the real later. challenges is narrowing the focus down to a specific amount of information that makes a case. And then it's hard to do your job, your norm, your day job, and also write and do whatever it is to to manage my business, which is, is cumbersome as well. So in the end, this is, that's why me, because I knew I had this, I, it it was, it was a um, divine intervention that saved me. And I knew that there were other people out there that had the same thing that were just as frustrated, but weren't doctors and couldn't understand the science behind it and right. could not bring it to other people, couldn't take care of other people because they just didn't have the training. So this is kind of, this is my life path just as much as my life path was delivering babies and doing surgery with uh, on women until then, 30 years of that. And then this is my life path now. Well, and that's what seemed to really strike the reporters is that you are not only talking the talk, you've walked the walk. You've mm-hmm. been through both sides of this reality and come out the other side for the better. And now you've spent 10 years doing that journey for and with the women that you treat mm-hmm. and extrapolating that in, into the men in their lives as well. And mm-hmm. now you treat men for this as well as you do women. And so they're saying, this is a story that needs to be told, and we're glad that we found it. Mm-hmm. We've written this book in order to tell this story. And when you see this podcast, we're going to be in London trying to tell everybody that we can get to listen and pay attention to this. But we'd like for you to pay attention to it as well. And if you're interested in what you've heard today, get a copy of our book. You can get one at thesecretfemalehormone.com. And as of March the 3rd, uh, they'll be in bookstores near you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. 
You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.